Hello and welcome to today's webinar. We still have a few people joining, so we will begin here shortly. In the meantime, please take a look at this interesting case while we wait. Okay, I think we are ready to go. My name is Erin Burnham and I will be your host for the webinar today. Before I hand over to Lucy, who will be presenting today's topic, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items with you. This webinar will be recorded and we will share this with you via email shortly. While we love hearing from you, we have all been placed on mute for the duration of the webinar. 
We do, however, welcome your questions and comments, so please type these into the chat box and we'll do our best to get through as many as possible at the end. And finally, if you are having any technical issues, please just let us know via the chat box and I'll do my best to help. Thank you again for joining us for today's webinar. This is the last in our equine winter webinar series. Today's topic is comparative imaging of the fetlock. Lucy is going to be presenting today's topic. Lucy qualified from the University of Liverpool in 2007. She worked in referral practice and first opinion practice in Newmarket, Yorkshire and Edinburgh before becoming a board certified specialist in diagnostic imaging in 2015. Lucy worked as a clinician in equine lameness and imaging prior to joining VETCT in 2020. Lucy currently divides her time between Lip Hook Equine Hospital in the UK and VETCT, where she is Director of Equine Teleradiology. Okay, I will now hand over to Lucy to start today's presentation. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you all for uh, coming on this sort of uh, winter Monday afternoon. Uh, it's really nice uh, to have you all here. Um, we're going to just start with a little bit of a whistle stop tour about what comparative imaging is and why it's important. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit about what's new. Um, there's been quite a lot of interesting developments in this field over the last few years. So it'd be really nice to chat through what's new. Um, and then we're going to look at some cases where we've used comparative imaging uh, in order to help with our diagnoses. So what is comparative imaging? Um, well, it's not really anything new. We've all been doing this for absolutely years. Um, and it's the use of multiple imaging modalities to answer a clinical question. So we all know that different imaging modalities have different strengths. We know that x-rays are really good for looking at bony detail. We can see soft tissue swellings, but we can't really see any soft tissue detail. We know that um, you know, uh, ultrasound is great for looking at bone margins, but we can't see any trabecular detail, but we can look at soft tissue structures better. So we're all used to using more than one uh, imaging modality to confirm our diagnosis. Now, this is a case um, that uh, I saw in practice a couple of years ago. So this is an eight-year-old sports horse gelding, um, lame on the left four. He blocked to a low four-point block, negative to an abaxial block to a low four-point block. Um, not a lot to see on x-rays, but palpably and radiographically, we had this very large uh, soft tissue swelling. Interestingly, this was very um, palmarolateral, um, not really so much on the palmaromedial aspect, although we've got this little um, irregularity on the palmar aspect of that sesamoid bone. Um, so obviously, I had a list of things that this could be from the radiographs. Um, however, it was the um, ultrasound that, that we needed to confirm this. So this is just um, one example ultrasound image of um, his palmar metacarpal region. We suspected he has a, a palmar annular ligament desmotomy, desmopathy from the radiographs. However, we needed ultrasound to confirm this. And we can see laterally to the left of the image, we can see from this image that the um, annular ligament is much more disrupted and abnormal laterally as compared to medially. So, like I say, um, comparative imaging isn't anything new, but there have been some developments recently that mean that we have much more, many more options when we think about comparative imaging. So if we take this case, which may look familiar, this is the case that we had um, as a case while you wait. Um, this is a 15 year old Irish sports horse stallion uh, who had been turned out in a field um, adjacent to some mares and had got a little bit overexcited about four weeks previously. Um, radiographs at the time didn't really show very much, but he had an effused fetlock joint. He was still lame four weeks later, so was referred in for further investigation. Um, and I think you can see from these radiographs, we've got some relatively proliferative new bone here on the dorsal proximal aspect of the proximal phalanx. And this comes around laterally as well. Um, there wasn't really much else we were excited about on these radiographs. And just with this pattern of new bone formation and the location, there was just a question mark about whether or not we had an incomplete fracture of the proximal phalanx uh, with slightly atypical bone, um, bone production. 
So we decided to do uh, an MRI and um, the horse was actually referred in for arthroscopy, but we decided to do an MRI first in order that we ruled out uh, any form of uh, potential prodromal fracture pathology. These are just still frontal images of the MRI. So you can see that, so this is the left hind fetlock. So this is the medial glenoid of the uh, proximal phalanx. And you can see we've got a lucent area within, sorry, a, a hyper intense area within the subchondral bone here, um, both on the T1 image on the left and the stir image on the right. Um, and you can see that we've got um, a widened joint space here on the stir as well. Um, so we can see um, that we have obviously got some subchondral bone pathology and subchondral bone collapse. And if we look at um, the sagittal image, which has disappeared, um, we can see that we have, um, this is quite palmar in the condyle, uh, sorry, in the glenoid here. Um, and there's also quite a lot of surrounding sclerosis and thickening of the subchondral bone. I always like to go back to the radiographs once I've um, looked at the MRI and just see actually, is this, could I have used the radiographs a little bit more uh, and could I have seen things a little bit um, more on the radiographs? So um, here I think we can see that we have got thickening of this um, subchondral bone, um, but I think it's relatively symmetrical, maybe a little bit more um, laterally there. And then I think we can see that we've got this very, very faint region of, of lucency just in the glenoid here. Um, I probably wouldn't, still wouldn't call that without having had the um, MRI, um, but I think it's really, really, uh, nice to look back at the radiographs and compare what we can see. So we've, I've already said this isn't anything new. Comparative imaging is something that we've been using for years. Um, but why am I here telling you about this now? So I think the important thing is that we've really had an increase in availability and affordability of standing cross-sectional imaging modalities in the last three to five years, really. Um, the Hallmark Standing MRI uh, has been around for a number of years now, and we're all very used to referring horses for MRI and, and um, getting MRI reports back um, and, and looking at fetlock pathology on the MRIs. But there have been, an, uh, mostly uh, in the CT field, there's been a number of advances, and there are a number of CT systems available now that are able to um, perform CT images of the distal limb of horses, specifically the fetlocks uh, for today's purposes, um, that are able to do that with the horse standing. Um, and then there is also um, the um, positron emission tomography system, which is available in the States. I'm not aware of any of those in Europe at the moment, um, which is also um, able to image the horse standing. So if we think about the CT, um, CT, machines that are available now, they broadly fall into two categories. Firstly, we have fan beam CT. So um, these are either adapted human um, systems, such as the one on the left here, or bespoke uh, equine systems, such as the one on the right here. These um, are a sort of conventional CT system. So the um, x-ray generator is in the donut here, and that flies around the horse and then the horse anatomy uh, so either the horse stays still and the CT machine moves. Uh, in, the, in fact, in both cases, the horse stays still and the CT gantry moves over the area of interest. In this um, machine, the horse um, stands on the ground, the CT machine is lowered and then comes forwards over the limb. In this system here, the machine is lowered onto the ground, the horse stands on a pedestal and the machine um, comes up around the legs. Uh, obviously, here we get both limbs uh, imaged, whereas here it's, it's only one. Um, but both systems um, can image from the hoof up to sort of the mid metacarpus metatarsus region. And both systems can also be used in general anesthesia for proximal limbs and caudal neck. Um, so those two systems are what we would call a fan beam system. So these are very conventional um, systems you get a nice, um, they, they quiet images slice by slice, so we don't have uh, any motion correction on those. Um, the image acquisition is very rapid, um, somewhere in the region of 30 seconds for the whole um, limb. So that's um, really quite fast, and then there is no motion correction because usually the horses don't move during that time. The other type of scanner that's available quite um, readily um, are the cone beam CTs. Now these are slightly different technology. So these acquire um, the image as one cone of information. So one revolution around the horse, 
will give all of the information for the area of interest. This is the Hallmark uh, Vision CT, Standing CT system. So this system can either image the foot or the fetlock, depending on um, which area is, is in the beam. Unfortunately, at the moment, the system can't go any higher than the fetlock. Um, and then this system on the right is the Equimagine robotic scanner. So this uh, system is one that's been developed in, by Penn State and the New Bolton Center. Um, and this can image distal limb up to carpus and tarsus and head and neck. The main uh, difference with this system is that it's a lower energy X-ray beam, so it has less image contrast, so we don't get as good a soft tissue definition as we do with the fan beam systems. Um, and also because the image is acquired as one block rather than as slices, we do um, have to put motion correction um, into there. So there are markers on the limb and there is motion correction integrated into the uh, image reconstruction. And then finally, we have the positron emission tomography. Um, so this is a relatively uh, novel um, system in, in the equine world. It's been used in human medicine for a number of years now. And this is essentially, to not to oversimplify it, uh, but essentially a three-dimensional scintigraphy. The horse is injected with a radioactive tracer, and that can either be bound to soft tissue or bone, and the uh, oh, sorry, soft tissue seeker or bone seeker, and the area of interest is then scanned. It allows identification of areas of increased activity in three dimensions. However, as you can see, the spatial resolution is um, not great. So this is a fat lock. This is a region of increased um, uptake in the proximal phalanx, which was consistent with a proximal phalanx sagittal um, groove injury. Um, this system is often used to acquire images in combination with either a standing CT or a, a standing MRI. And that then enables these images to be co-registered, as you can see in this case. So these are the raw PET images, these are the raw CT images, and these are the images co-registered. And you can see this helps us to identify areas of increased uptake on the PET scan, which correspond with areas of um, bone lysis in this um, CT examination. And this was a horse with a septic fetlock, so these were areas of sort of active bone resorption. Um, due to um, uh, osteomyelitis. So um, this is quite um, a new um, and emerging field, often used in racehorses for detection of prodromal fracture pathology, but can be used with it in combination with a soft tissue um, marker in order to identify deep digital flex tendon pathology um, and other soft tissue pathologies. This system, as far as I'm aware, there are no um, systems installed in Europe at the moment, there are a, a number of systems in, in the US. So what's the difference between all of these modalities? We're, we're kind of a bit spoiled for choice um, as to you know, the modalities that are available. So how do we choose which one um, to use in which case? Well, for me, um, I like to think of you know, what, what clinical questions these are gonna answer and what they're going to tell us. So for me, standing MRI gives us a really good idea of activity within bone so it gives us idea of stir signal fluid signal so it can tell us about bone pathology but it doesn't give us great definition of fine detail of the bone when we're looking at uh, standing mris in the fetlock we've got a larger slice um, thickness and a larger slice gap which means that smaller defects can be um less easy to spot um and also we have summation artifact as well so uh, or in some cases so we do have to be aware that although Standing MRI gives us a good idea of bone activity. It doesn't always give us a good idea of the definition of the bone, but it does give us really good soft tissue detail and really good idea about soft tissue activity. So standing MRI ticks a lot of our boxes. Van Beam CT gives us excellent bone definition. The images are truly beautiful. We get really, really lovely um, definitions for regular bone. However, we can't really see what's going on in that bone. We can see if there's loss of um, mineral or loss of um, density, but what we can't see is, is there any fluid or um, hemorrhage or fat necrosis in there, which is what we're showing with a stir signal. It gives us really, really good detail of the soft tissues, um, but it doesn't always give us an idea of what's active lesions and what's an inactive lesion. Um, we can use contrast in order to see um, vascularity of um, the lesions, but sometimes it's not that easy to determine. And certainly in the standing system, as we'll come on to later, we don't always have the option to do intra-arterial um, contrast. 
Bone beam CT um, gives us a really, really good idea of what's going on in the bone, gives us a nice idea of bone definition, really useful for looking for fractures, uh, small osteochondral fragmentation and things like that. Unfortunately, it doesn't give us very much soft tissue detail. Um, it hasn't got um, a high powered x-ray generator and you get really poor soft tissue contrast. But, in con but this is where using standing MRI in conjunction with a cone beam CT is great because then we take all of our boxes um, and then similarly fan beam CT in conjunction with a standing MRI also ticks a lot of our boxes. PET as we've already said gives us a really good idea of bone activity or soft tissue activity depending on which tracer we choose to use um, but we've already said that that's got quite poor spatial resolution so we need to co-register that with another cross-sectional imaging modality in order to fully localize uh, the pathology. So we know that we've got standing um, CT and standing MRI much more widely available now, but actually do we know how useful uh, it is? We know, and there's been a growing body of evidence over a number of, uh, over the last 20 years about, um, about using CT and MRI in horses and, and what it tells us from a, an osteo, a musculoskeletal um, point of perspective, um, but there's been not, that many um, papers looking at actually comparing CT, MRI, and um, so fan beam CT, cone beam CT, and MRI because the technology hasn't been there previously. And there's been some really, really nice work that's come out uh, over the past three to five years as that has shown um, differences and, and the different usefulness of these different imaging modalities. So there's been quite a lot of um, research that has been primarily racehorse and thoroughbred focused. So a lot of these have been cadaver studies. There's some very, very interesting work being done by Anna Maria Nagy's group at the University of Budapest, which is looking at um, a cohort of non-lame thoroughbred yearlings and then following them through the training process. So um, I believe just the first paper for the yearling part of the study has been published at the moment, but I know there's more um, work in the pipeline looking at how these the findings that they find in yearlings have changed with it training in two-year-olds. Um, so it's really quite exciting that we've got these comparative um, papers that are now coming out. So we're going to look a little bit more detail in the, uh, the cadaver studies that have come out of um, the University of Cambridge recently, um, but just to be aware that there are other studies going on and that there will be a real sort of flood of information in the next few years with looking at how we use these imaging modalities and how we can best use them for our patients. So if we think first about um, this cadaver study um, that used cone beam and fan beam computer tomography and low field, so standing MRI, for detection of palmar plantar osteochondral disease in thoroughbred horses. Now we know palmar osteochondral disease is a real, um, really common pathology that we find in thoroughbred racehorses. It's a real, um, common performance limiting performance uh, pathology and it also um, you know can cause a lot of um, welfare issues with the red racehorses so we know that actually early diagnosis and treatment is key in being able to manage these horses in the long term um, so this uh, study looked at what the comparison between fan beam cone beam and st uh, standing MRI for detection of pod lesions and found that fan beam CT is the most sensitive for diagnosis of pod lesions. So um, MRI was the least sensitive, um, but the most specific because they could look at the bone fluid and the bone activity associated with these lesions, as well as um, the small um, bone lesions that were present. Um, CT images were superior to MRI images for detecting focal subchondral bone irregularity, and we know that that's really important because actually horses that have subchondral bone irregularity or subchondral bone depressions actually are more likely um, to have a poor prognosis for return to racing versus those that don't have a subchondral bone um, irregularity. But MRI images were much more useful to detect for detecting the pathological status and severity of the lesions. So. Um, these images all are related to this cadaver specimen here on the bottom right. Um, sorry, um, we can see that we have on our, um, this is a cone beam CT and this is a fan beam CT. And we can see we have these um, well-defined areas of sclerosis within the condyles. And we've got these small hypo attenuating lesions here, which are reflected on MRI with signal heterogeneity 
we can see in this image here, we've got some stir signal as well. But what we can see on the CT, which isn't detectable on the MRI, is these focal depressions in the subchondral bone, which are um, much more likely to result in a poor prognostic indicator for this horse a long term racing career. And these are the associated lesions that we're seeing on our um, cadaver specimen. So these are the um, sort of gross pathology images. This was a cadaver study. Similarly, from the same group, we had um, a the similar same cadavers using um, the three dimensional imaging techniques in order to um, assess the detection of parasagittal groove and proximal phalanx sagittal groove fissures. These are really, really common areas of pathology in the thoroughbred racehorse, uh, really common to have incomplete fractures in these regions, which can propagate to complete fractures um, and, and be catastrophic for the racehorse if we're not uh, diagnosing these early enough. So what this group found was that all modalities, all modalities were able to identify the fissures, but the sensitivity for fissure detection was higher in CT um, and actually it was highest in cone beam CT versus fan beam CT. Um, one of their limitations was that obviously these were cadaver, cadaver images, so we didn't have any motion artifact. So it would be interesting to see how that's reflected in a live uh, population of horses. The specificity was much higher in the MRI studies, and that was due to the associated fluid signal um, that you see with active uh, fissures. Um, and they found histopathologically that all fissures were associated with features of fatigue bone injury. So this fits with the um, pathological theory that these are due to repetitive overload um, type injury and bone resorption um, due to that. The third study out of this group um, showed that um, they did a comparison of cone beam and fan beam computer tonography for the detection of um, the osteochondral defects of these little fragments at the dorsal, uh, sorry, osteochondral defect, these little defects at the dorsal proximal aspect of the proximal phalanx. And again, they found that all modalities were able to detect these, um, but that fan beam CT had the highest sensitivity for the detection of the lesions. Um, cone beam CT could detect lesions um, of sensitivity of 60% for detection of lesions more than five millimeters in width. Um, and then MRI had a sensitivity of 60% for detection of defects about 15 millimeters in width. So this fits with what we know about MRI uh, and the slice width. That means that we, we have a wider slice width um, in the standing MRIs at the fetlock. So we know that, that our resolution for detection of, of, of subtle defects may be decreased. However, they found MRI was very useful for detection of concurrent stir signal within the bone and also concurrent um, subchondral bone thickening. So these are examples of the type of osteochondral defects that they were looking at. So these are um, the sort of size and shape of the osteochondral defects. And actually, the interesting thing is that all imaging modalities underestimated the size of the osteochondral defects. And that's probably because they're looking at the osseous part of the osteochondral defect and not just the cartilaginous part. Interestingly, uh, on MRI, the absence of the articular cartilage layer wasn't pathognomonic for um, osteochondral defects in the proximal phalanx. Now, whether again, that's a, a resolution issue, so volume averaging, or whether that is um, just inherently, we are very uh, low field MRI is very poor at looking at uh, cartilage thickness on uh, in fetlocks just because of the very, very thin cartilage in that region. So that may uh, have something to do with that as well. So those three papers have summarized very nicely um, how the um, three modalities perform for um, detection of lesions in each um, of the more common areas for a thoroughbred racehorse. And they're quite a nice set of papers to read together. The other thing that really hasn't been commented on in the standing um, imaging modalities as things stand is, is the use of uh, contrast. Now we all, if we're doing GA um, CT, so if we're doing distal limb CT, um, we would normally use intra-arterial contrast, uh, but we can use intra-articular as well. So oftentimes we will do a distal limb study, do an intra-arterial contrast, and then do an intra-articular contrast of the joint of interest. Contrast use hasn't really been published in uh, standing CT. There is some anecdotal evidence for use of intra-articular cartilage, uh, sorry, intra-articular contrast for detection of cartilage defects in the standing systems. Um, but I, I would say it's less common uh, than we are seeing in the GA systems. 
Um, and there has been a relatively recent publication looking at intrathecal contrast administration in the flex tendon sheath. Again, this is a cadaver study, um, but for detection of tendon lesions. And given that we often do um, contrast uh, studies within the tendon sheath when we're blocking them um, radiographically to see if we have uh, Manica flexoria uh, tears, it will be interesting to see if we can use that in, in standing CT. Uh, as we've said, we frequently use intra-arterial contrast in CTs done under general anesthesia, but I haven't seen any reports of um, that being done in standing systems. Uh, please feel free to correct me if I'm wrong. Um, so that sort of concludes the literature overview part of the um, webinar. And I was going to use the next sort of part of the webinar to look at some comparative cases and actually look at what we're seeing um, and what advantages and disadvantages we have of using multimodal imaging uh, in clinical cases. It is a little bit thoroughbred racehorse heavy because that reflects the um, population that I see, um, but hopefully there's some take home tips that we can use uh, in other uh, imaging, you know, so in other um, populations of horses as well. So our first case is a four-year-old thoroughbred racehorse. Um, he's been fairly heavily raced in his two and three-year-old seasons, and he had a low-grade left hind limb lameness for the past six months. Um, he had responded to diagnostic analgesia of the metatarsophalangeal joint um, and actually come back, went back to racing, and he then went lame on his left forelimb. So historically, his problems had often been hind limb, but actually we're looking at his left fore. So I'm going to run these through as quickly as, uh, as videos, because I think it often um, gives you a better idea of what's going on than still images, but we will pause and have a look at some still images as well. So these are standing MRI images from the Hallmark system. We have a T1 frontal and a T2 star frontal. And what I'll do is I'll just scroll through. So we're going from Palmer to dorsal here. So I'll scroll through once and then we'll stop and I will talk about what I'm seeing. And we'll go back from dorsal to Palmer. So we can see here, so this is sort of mid uh, dorsal to Palmer, we can see that we've got um, it's left four, so this is lateral. Left four, so this is lateral. And we can see that we've got fairly marked area of decreased signal intensity on T1 and increased signal intensity on T2 with a hyper intense room. So that to me is a fluid signal. The stirs were a little bit wobbly, which is um, can be standard in a fetlock. So I haven't put those up, but this was quite bright on stir as well. Um, we can see as we come further palmally, there is a sort of Ill poorly defined region of hyperintensity just here within the condyles. If we go into some transverse images, so we've got a T1, T2 star, and a T2 fast spin echo here. And we can see as we come down that this lateral condyle is again, uh, has quite a marked fluid signal within it. So we've got this hyperintensity on T2 with a hypo-intense rim, decreased signal intensity on T1. And we've still got some decreased signal intensity on T2 fast spin echo, which means there's some sclerosis there but that it's not as intense um, as it might be. Okay, so if we look at the still images, I still think there's this hyper intense line here through the lateral condyle. We can see we've got some fluid signal here within the lateral condyle and, and some sclerosis here within the medial condyle. And when we went to look at the sagittal images, we actually had um, a fairly well-defined region of signal hyperintensity within the um, subchondral sort of trabecular bone and um, just deep to the subchondral bone there. So to me, this horse had um, marked fluid signal within the lateral condyle, a suspicious hyperintense line in the lateral condyle. So I was suspicious of an incomplete palmar cortical fracture, but also we had some signal change that was um, it's consistent with a palmar osteochondral lesion as well. So the questions were actually, which is the most significant lesion in this horse? I was highly suspicious we had an incomplete palmar cortical fracture, but the surgeons wanted a little bit more information um, for surgical planning. Um, and also the other question was, if this horse has both a palmar cortical incomplete fracture and a pod lesion, what is the prognosis for going back to work? 
So this horse had AECT as well. So this is a standing CT from the Calibra system. And we can see as we scroll through that we have got a subchondral bone defect just here. We've got quite marked sclerosis through the condyle. And we have, we've got a very well-defined, fairly long uh, fracture line, incomplete fracture line going through that palmar osteochondral lesion. And we can see that in the transverse as well. So this is our transverse scan. This is our transverse scan. Um, and as we can see, it's a transverse reconstruction, sorry. We can see quite nicely, we've got that short incomplete fracture just there. So the um, CT confirmed that we had a pod lesion uh, and a short incomplete fracture. And also that we had a, an irregularity of the subchondral bone plate, which again is a poorer prognostic indicator. Um, so what did our CT add? Well, it confirmed the presence and the orientation of the fracture for surgical planning, and it identified the subchondral bone irregularity that was associated with our pod lesion. It confirmed also that we had fairly moderate periarticular new bone formation, um, which may be uh, leads us to a suspicion of having a cartilage defect between that and the subchondral bone irregularity. So it was important overall for treatment planning and prognosis in, in this case. Um, moving on to a second case. So this is a, a slightly different horse. It's an endurance horse. And endurance horses do tend to get relatively similar injuries to, to race horses in that they get um, a lot of bone fatigue type injuries. This one was acutely lame right for during training and responded to intra-articular analgesia of the fetlock. So we have a frontal set from our standing MRI. Um, and we can see really quite marked um, fluid signal on our T2 star here. So we've got quite marked increased signal uh, in the region of the parasagittal groove. And we've also got a little bit um, on the um, medial aspect as well. And you can see that goes quite far palmally within the um, within the parasagittal groove. If we go into the transverse images, we can see similarly, we've got this really quite marked fluid signal here and it is biaxial, it is sitting um, in both parasagittal grooves here and here. So based on the MRI alone, um, I was highly suspicious that we had short incomplete fractures in both the medial and the lateral parasagittal groove. Um, more markedly medially, this is the right force, and more markedly medially, um, but we were suspicious of these being biaxial. Obviously, from a surgical planning point of view, that doesn't really help the surgeons because we need to know which side um, we want, where, where we want to compress and or where we want to have our glide hole for the legs crew. Um, so this horse had a CT as well. So this is a slightly different CT system to the one we've just been looking at. This is um, the pen robotic standing system. Uh, so it's a cone beam system. You'll notice there's a lot less soft tissue uh, definition as well as um, the, the trabecular bone pattern is a little bit less detailed, but it does give us a lot, a lot of information. So we're going to just scroll through. Um, so we're looking at this area here, our medial and lateral parasagittal grooves. And we're gonna go from forward to back. So from palmer to dorsal. Yeah, and this is the region that I'm concerned about here. So we have got a very short uh, region of hyper hypo attenuation just in that region there. We do have some beam hardening artifacts. You can see a diagonal line going up here, but the line that I'm worried about in the parasagittal groove is going in a slightly different direction just here. Um, so I'm confident that isn't beam hardening artifact. And if we look in a transverse reconstruction, we can see that we have this almost circular region of hypoattenuation within the trabecular bone here. So this is a lot milder and a lot less um, obvious than the one that we saw previously. Um, this is um, obviously the fluid signal in the MRI was more um, more profound, but the actual area of um, signaling tech change on the CT is less profound. So 
if we think about what RCT added in this situation, well, actually, it confirmed that there was an abnormality of the um, parasit the medial parasitical groove, and, and we determined that was a short, incomplete parasitical fracture. It was very short, and it did have a very chronic appearance. It was slightly more rounded and slightly more, um, so it had more of a dome shape than a, than a truly linear shape. Um, so that meant to me it was chronic in appearance on the CT, but actually on the MRI, it looked quite active. And that actually helped us to inform treatment because um, the surgeons were wanting to know whether or not um, to put a lag screw across this um, or could it be managed conservatively. For me, this one potentially could have been ma managed conservatively. And it's very interesting that whenever I show this one to surgeons, uh, there is often a 50-50 split. Half of them would pop a lag, lag screw across there. Half of them would... Um, not and they would uh, leave it for conservative management either way this horse needed a, a considerable period of rest um in order to avoid the, the the pathology propagating and to avoid a catastrophic fracture okay and then this is just the final case um to look at and this is a six-year-old thoroughbred racehorse that um was presented for for assessment of poor performance. Um, he wasn't overtly lame, um, but had effused metacarpophalangeal joints bilaterally. Um, I've just done this one as still images because there was an awful lot going on. Um, so this is his left um, forelimb. So we have quite a marked area of sclerosis, which is the red arrows within the medial condyle. And then we've got um, an area of subtle hypoattenuation within the um, trabecular, within the sclerosis, which to me is consistent with a palmar osteochondral lesion. We have got a very, very subtle um, de deviation of the subchondral bone plate here and a little, um, just a little loosened area here, which is consistent with some subchondral bone resorption. Interestingly, we've got this little um, sort of um, divot, as it were, or, or a defect in the, um, medial glenoid of the um, proximal phalanx sort of at the junction of the sagittal groove and the medial glenoid, which is in a very unusual location. Um, normally, um, traumatic injuries in this area would expect to be at the bottom of the sagittal groove, but we can see that we've got this and we've got quite marked thickening of the subchondral bone plate here when we compare it to um, the lateral subchondral bone plate. And then the third thing that we've got is we've got this sort of triangular shaped uh, region of sclerosis within um, the center, center of the um, uh, sagittal ridge, which is extending into the trabecular bone, um, and then a very mild pod lesion laterally as well. So this horse had an awful lot going on. So I don't like giving people a shopping list when they send me a, a CT, but unfortunately in this case, um, we kind of had to. So he had a pod lesion in his medial condyle, an osteochondral defect within the medial glenoid, moderate osteoarthropathy of the metacarpophalangeal joint, and then sclerosis of the sagittal ridge of the third metatarsal bone, which likely represents a hyperextension injury. Obviously, um, this horse was presented for a poor performance workup. We want to know actually what is causing this horse's problem. And also, I was slightly worried about this osteochondral defect. It's in an unusual place. The subchondral bone is quite thick and around it. And actually, our question was, is this a prodromal fracture pathology? Could this um, preempt a fracture? So we went ahead and mri this horse. Um, so we can see on the MRI, this is our um, Palmer uh, region of sclerosis um, in the medial condyle. We've got a little bit of fluid signal there on stirs. It's a little bit active, but it's not um, terribly so. We can see that we've got our, this is a thickening of our subchondral bone plate here. We've got a very, very subtle irregularity of the um, medial um, glenoid just here. Had I not seen that on uh, MRI, I'm not sure I would have called that, but um, sorry, I had not seen it on CT, I'm not sure I'd have called it on the MRI, but confident in the knowledge it's there on the CT, I think there is a slight deviation of the subchondral bone plate there, and we can see that the uh, subchondral bone plate of the proximal phalanx is slightly thickened. But what interested me the most with this horse is actually the most active lesion uh, in the fetlocks was really the lesion that I was maybe less concerned about on the CT. And um, we can see that this is our dorsal um, sclerosis within the sagittal ridge. And actually on the MRI, we've got quite marked fluid signal here um, surrounding this. This is a T2 star, and we've got quite marked hyper 
attenuation here with a hypo attenuating rim. So actually this probably is uh, one of the sources of pain in, in this horse. So what did our MRI add? Well, it determined which was the most significant location of injury currently, and it determined the significance of the osteochondral defect in the proximal phalanx. I'm not worried that that's pre-fracture pathology, um, although it probably it isn't normal, and there is probably a um, you know an element of bony reaction going on there because of the thickening of the subchondral bone plate. And it also determined the, the MRI determined the absence of prodromal fracture pathology, which gives the confidence to um, not completely rest this horse, but to modify the training program accordingly. So I hope those three cases have helped you to um, see the usefulness of doing comparative imaging and actually how the two cross-sectional imaging modalities, MRI and CT, mesh together well. But the next question is, sort of which imaging modality should we be using? And, and you, know, you know, which is best? What can we do? Well, there's no one best approach for any case. Um, it really does depend on your population of horses that you're looking at. So racehorses, polo ponies, endurance horses often get sort of bony fatigue type injuries. So perhaps a CT would give us a lot of the answers in those cases. And sometimes, you know, we do need the higher definition and um, higher bony definition that we get from the CT in order to definitively identify things like fractures. Um, so a fan boom CT or a cone boom CT may give you a reasonable amount of information in those cases. Show jumping event horses, dressage horses, pleasure horses, oftentimes either have a combination of osseous and soft tissue injuries or primarily have soft tissue injuries. So MRI maybe in com combination with a fan boom CT or a cone boom CT would give us an awful lot of, of detail. Um, the Cone beam CT systems and, and standing MRI systems work very, very well uh, in harmony, uh, as does the, fan, the standing fan beam CT. And I think it really does just depend on what, what you have locally. You know, all of these systems will give us more information. Um, so it depends what you have available locally. If I had a CT scanner an hour away in one direction, an MRI scanner an hour away in another direction, I may send the racehorse towards the CT scanner and maybe more likely to send the show jumper event horse more more towards the MRI scanner. I'm obviously very spoiled in my clinic. I have both. Um, so I'm able to um, maybe um, funnel them a little bit more um, selectively. However, I use a, a the CT scanner I have is, is under general anesthetic. So actually we tend to use standing MRI for most things in our clinic. Um, PET would be great to have in order to um, more easily localize areas of um, increased bone activity and PET and standing MRI or PET and, and standing CT would be an amazing combination to have. Unfortunately, uh, in the UK, that's just not that available at the moment. So what are the take home messages from today? Um, so I think the main take home message for me is that these advanced imaging modalities complement each other. We don't have one perfect advanced image or one perfect imaging modality at all. And we know that by doing multiple different imaging modalities, we build up layers. You know, we, we can often see things we're suspicious of on radiographs that we confirm on MRI. We can often see things on MRI that we're suspicious might have a, an osseous component that we can confirm on CT. So everything that we do just builds up the layers of information that we've got and um, builds up um, our understanding of how these um, injuries occur. I think the real big take home is that standing imaging is becoming increasingly available and that um, a lot of horses that maybe weren't previously able to go for advanced imaging may have that um, ability now, or we, we may have the ability to send them for that now. And I think the other thing is that each case is different, even with relatively similar looking um, pathology on MRI, as, as we saw with the cases I showed, you can have some very different um, actual pathology going on. So I think um, there is no one size fits all with these um, systems, but I think it's just good to be aware of what's out there. So does anyone have any questions? Thank you, Lucy. Um, we have had a few questions come in already. As a reminder, please enter your questions into the chat box and we'll get through as many as time allows. Okay, let's get started. Our first question, uh, would you consider a blood vessel as a differential diagnosis to the hyperdense case hyperdense line in case one? Um, 
I think in this case, and I think it shows better when we run through the images rather than um, just looking at the stills, but I'll just put the still back up. Uh, I think in this case, this line is very straight. It's not torturous. Um, I think there are blood vessels that, that sort of come towards it and that join um, join with that image. Um, but I think for me, the, the line is too straight and too well defined. And obviously in combination with having had the um, fluid on the uh, MRI, I would be very confident that that is a, um, a fracture line. We do see a lot of hypervascularity in these condyles of um, racehorses in training, and we do spend a lot of time tracing the blood vessels to make sure we aren't um, mistaking blood vessels for a fracture line. But in this case, I'm very confident because of the straight, um, the, 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 the very straight um, anatomy of the line and also the location that the blood vessels don't normally aren't normally that prominent that far distantly. Thank you. Next question: What imaging features do you look for as a prodromal fracture pathology on both CT and MRI? Well, MRI, I'm um, really looking for the fluid signal, um, so looking for a, a sort of area of the stir signal or a T two star hyper um, intensity with a hypo intense rim, um, looking for that type of pattern. And usually that will uh, span the parasagittal groove. So oftentimes if it's sort of more axial and, and it's sort of the, the trajectory of the area of fluid alteration is sort of pointing more towards the middle of the bone, that is more to me a, a, a fracture um, fracture than a, a palmar osteochondral disease which tends to be more central within the um within the uh, condyle on a ct we're looking for um hypo intense hypo attenuating lines um, and we're looking for those in places where you wouldn't normally see a blood vessels that kind of leads on from the, the question before we're looking for those in orientations that blood vessels wouldn't normally travel in um, and we're looking for those that are going through the actual subchondral bone plate spend an awful lot of time when we're looking at CTs, changing um, the angles uh, that we're slicing through to make sure that we're slicing through in every possible um, fracture plane angle, which is a real advantage of having the CT um, where we can do the sort of um, multiplanar reconstructions. Whereas with the MRI, we're very much, um, with, with the sequences that we tend to get with a fetlock, we're quite um, constrained to the planes that um, we've acquired those in. Um, so yeah, on an MRI, we're looking for fluid signal and on a CT, we're looking for hypo attenuating lines, usually with surrounding sclerosis. Thank you. Next question. If you were investigating a sports horse with a tendon sheath effusion with negative ultrasound findings, what would be your first choice of advanced imaging, imaging modality? I think that's an interesting one. And I think, um, Certainly, we see a number of horses referred for uh, MRI examination of the tendon sheath. And, and the lesions that we have in the tendon sheath are often quite small. And we've already spoken about the um, sort of the, the thick slice thickness within the, the MRI in that region. So for me, I possibly would go for a CT if I had a standing CT available and maybe consider putting contrast. Uh, into the tendon sheath and see if we can see uh, the manica quite nicely and see if we can see any longitudinal tears. I think it would be very interesting to do that in one of the non-weight bearing um, CT machines. So the Calibra type machine where the horse's limb is extended forward into the machine rather than in the weight bearing um, cone boom CT or Asto machines because um, it might just open out um, any deep digital flex tendon tear. Um, I suspect um, we could use them, I know you could use MRI, but sometimes it can be a little bit challenging to differentiate small tendon lesions on an MRI. Thank you. Um, if you could only have CT or MRI in your practice, which would you choose? It's a very difficult one because I'm very spoiled and I have both. Um, I, I think I would probably err towards MRI because it gives us a better idea of bone activity. However, it really doesn't give us a lot of structural, well, it doesn't give us really fine structural detail. So small osteochondral fragments, small osteochondral defects, and as we've seen, fracture lines sometimes aren't as clear as, as you might want. Um, 
so I think I would um, obviously want both uh, in an ideal world, but I think um, my preference, I'd probably still swing for MRI. I'd be really interested, there's quite a lot of work going on at the moment, looking at whether or not we can use dual energy CT um, to detect bone edema. So that may, uh, in the future, give us the best of both worlds. Thank you. All right, I think that is all the questions that we have for today. Um, thank you again, Lucy, for sharing your insight and expertise with us. And thank you to everyone who joined us for today's webinar. If you have any additional questions or would like further information, please get in touch with us using the contact information shown here or by taking a look at our website. Thanks again and enjoy the rest of your day.